Chris here, and this is Chewy's latest laptop. It's called the CoreBook X. Now, this particular model here was sent out to me from Chewy. They are not approving of this video before I publish it on YouTube, and I'm not being paid for this at all. So this one here is powered by the Core i5, the 8259U. That's a 28 watt part. It has the Iris Plus 655 graphics. It does have a 1440p 3 by 2 aspect ratio IPS screen in it, a backlit keyboard, rather large touchpad, Type-C that is supporting power delivery to 4K out from it as well, has a 46 watt hour battery, and in my time testing it, this is Chewy's best laptop so far, but there are a few things you do need to know before you consider pulling the trigger on this laptop that I will be covering in this in-depth review. So I have been using this laptop for a week and I haven't wiped it down with alcohol to clean it, make it look all nice and pretty for my video. No, you can see fingerprints, smudges. And what is this? A little tiny mark. That is in fact a little ding in the alloy. And what happened was, is when I turned it around before, I accidentally put it on top of a screw, but I didn't apply any pressure or anything like that. And it did leave a mark. So this alloy is very, very soft and it has this matte paint job that is just an absolute magnet for those fingerprints. So one-handed openers out there that you can't open it with one hand, okay? You can see it starts to lift up then the whole body. So two hands are needed. Unfortunately, you're gonna to have to put that coffee down when you open it up. And I don't know why so many people make such a big deal about one-handed opening anyway. And our backlit keyboard. So this one automatically does time out. And we've seen this keyboard before on many of their different laptops. It is a good keyboard. I do like typing on it. So pressing down here, there is really no flex, just a little tiny bit, and it doesn't really bounce. It's not a loud keyboard to type on. Feedback from these keys is fine. It's about 1.5 millimeters of travel. There is one thing I don't like about it, and that is the power button location. I really wish they had separated this away and put it just up here, it would be a lot better. So often I go to hit delete and I tap the power button. So that's one thing. But I do set this in Windows settings to do nothing when I press it to help solve any issues of that or the annoyance of accidentally pressing it. Full size arrow keys, and then there are the shortcuts at the top here. So print screen is all there, the insert page up and down, and home is over here. And then the controls there. So backlight keyboards, the back lighting on this is actually very good, evenly distributed, looks great. So that is the first level, second, and the brightest, which is the third. I'll just turn the lights off so you can see it a little bit better. I really do like how it lights up this keyboard very evenly. There's only just a couple of areas that you could criticize. Maybe the shift right there in the middle is not so evenly distributed, the light on it, but overall it's good. And as you can see, it does time out after about 10 seconds to save on battery. Palm rest, this is made out of plastic. Chewy touchpad, it's okay, it's not bad. I mean, it does have the left and right hardware mouse keys inside there. What I have noticed is, with their other ones too as well, find a little fiddly movements, like when I go to select or highlight something, say in Paint or I'm in Photoshop or whatever, it's very hard to sometimes get those finer movements. It's a little fiddly and the cursor does tend to jump around all over the place. So I do rate it as an average touchpad, Left side, we've got our DC in for charging, which will take a couple of hours. And this is a full spec power delivery supporting Type-C port, 4K60 status LED, so red when charging, green once fully charged. Type-C charging does take quite a bit longer, I've noticed. It will take then approximately about two and a half to almost three hours to fully charge. And then on the right, we do have a micro SD card slot. Sadly, it's still USB 2.0 hub wired up this one. So the speeds are only maxing out around 25, 24 megabytes per second. 3.5 with mic support, and then our USB 3.0A. Then on the underside here, four rubber feet, intake vent here, so do not block this, and they have screws holding everything in. So I just removed a couple already because I want to show you how we have to get access to the internals if you wanted to add another SSD. So sadly, like the other models, they had the easy access hatch that would have been about here. So it was just two screws, you could install another SSD, like the CoreBook Pro, the original CoreBook model. Uh, that's not there. So there is one screw on either side here with a rear rubber feet. This so you need to pull that off and you can access that screw. There will be another one under this. And I'll show you the internals now. And then with the internals here, there are some good things and some bad. So we cannot upgrade the wireless card. That is part of the motherboard. The good, and I'm really happy to see this, finally manufacturers are listening and in doing this, we've got a SODIMM slot here. So we can add an extra eight gigabytes of RAM if you wanted improved, especially the integrated graphics performance and slightly better just multitasking. Having the dual channel memory is so much better because of the memory bandwidth improvement we get and it really benefits the integrated graphics that Iris Pro 655. 
and here is our drive. So we cannot add another NVMe drive. That's why there is no quick and easy open little slot there for us to just put another one in because there is no space for it. But they've got a lot of free space around the side here. So the single fan, the two copper transfer pipes right here, and thermals so far are actually checking out, but I'll get onto that later on in depth and detail too, and I'll break out the thermal imaging camera. Down the bottom here, we have either side two sets, well, two in here, so four little speakers in total, and I'll give you a sample now of what they sound like. And looking at our weight now, so the laptop, this is just 1.49 kilos. And if I add our power cable, the 65 watt power supply, that's a DC charger, then that brings it up to 1.72 kilos as our total travel weight. One other positive with this laptop is we do have a completely unlocked BIOS. And I mean everything, all the advanced settings, power limits, you could even undervolt through these menus here if you wanted to do so. Now you must be careful because some of these settings, if you change them, you don't know what you're doing, you could end up basically bricking this laptop and it won't boot. So I recommend not messing about with any of these settings unless you really know what you are doing. And now taking a look at our screen. So this one is a three by two aspect ratio, 14 inch IPS screen. Resolution is 2160 by 1440p. And I have now calibrated it with my Spider 5 Pro and I'll show you the color gamut and coverage. That is the uncalibrated view, which had a bit of a greenish tint to it, a bit of a bluish tint, really quite poor calibration out of the box. And well, you'd expect it kind of for the price of this particular laptop. So having a look at the color coverage here, we've got 96% of sRGB, NTSC is 69%, Adobe RGB is 74%, like I've seen on the other Chewy laptops, very similar screens in them, and then 74% of P3 as well. So this panel covered in glass, it is very, very reflective. So I've had to put my lights to one side, otherwise they reflect all over the place. Now the maximum screen brightness, that does check out. It's not too bad. It's 369 nits of brightness. That's at its maximum setting there, which is, it's reasonably good. It's not bad for indoor use. And that is the lowest setting, which is a little bright for me. This is still about 20 nits. Ideally, I like to see a little bit dimmer than this. Now you do see the borders either side, that's because this is a three by two ratio screen. I've got it set currently at the, well, the resolution that it supports. So that's why it's like this because it's the 2160 by 1440p. So the SSD that I showed you when we took a look at the internals, that Kingston, here are the speeds, they're okay. And like I've mentioned many times, this is not a Samsung 970 Evo kind of speed that uh, you can get a lot better if you want it faster. You could replace that with a Samsung drive, which would perform and almost double, well, yes, definitely double the sequential reads and writes there. The randoms are good. And overall, this is so much quicker than SATA 3. And by far, out of my testing, at least, of Chewy products, this is their fastest laptop yet. So under here in the device manager, that is the model of the drive, if you wanted to look that up. I don't know why you'd really need to do that. And here we have the internet, which is dual band wireless AC. Uh, not the best, okay? I mean, the 72065 was a really good wireless chip. And I'm getting throughputs of around 380 megabits per second. But really, they should have gone with Intel's AX200 or the 201 that also does have Bluetooth 5 support. This is only Bluetooth 4, and that would have been a lot quicker. And there is our processor. Of course, it is listed here eight times because it is multi-threaded. So it has two threads per core, and it's a quad core. Maximum turbo is 3.8 gigahertz, and really nothing else of interest there in the device manager. Geekbench. Five score here. I mean, it's okay. And again, this is Chewy's fastest so far. They do have a 10th gen laptop that I haven't tested yet, but out of my testing, this is the quickest yet I have seen from them. Chewy is using a 28 watt power limit here. Now we can increase this power limit. We can also undervolt, but I won't be doing it in this video. I'll keep everything as stock. So there is that possibility to further improve performance if you wanted to do so. If you've got one of these, you could repaste it. You can increase the power limit under vault and it would really improve things. Let's have a look now at 4K performance. This is one of my own videos, so just load it up and everything has been loading in quite quick. Of course, there is ads here. Thanks, I'll just mute that, sorry about that. And skip this hit and enable the stats for nerds and put it onto 4K, of course. And you'll see that it's able to handle this. And there we go, 4K resolution. Just needs a little bit to cache and I don't have the best internet connection. 
and this is fine. You can see that it's not dropping any frames at all, but I'm not full screen. So going over to full screen, it will normally drop a couple of frames when you do that. And it didn't. Okay, so that hasn't dropped anything. And that does seem very, very smooth. Seems really good. So these 8th gen chips, even though they're old, they are just so much better than the 6th gen, 7th, 7th gen that Chewy has used previously, and so much better than the weaker Gemini Lake. Here's our webcam, so you can hear straight away that as soon as I stop talking, hear that? There's some interference coming through on these microphones. So the webcam quality is poor, it's choppy, the frame rate, you can probably see right now, it's about 15 frames per second only, and that interference over the microphones is not good at all to hear. And taking a look now at some video playback performance, so this is a 4K clip, 60 frames per second. Sony Swordsmith one, and you can see that's playing just fine. It is 60 frames per second. There is no noticeable lag. A jellyfish sample file here. This one is 10-bit HEVC. A few little stutters at the beginning, as you can see, and if I skip ahead, it's a little slow and struggling a little bit with this one, but once it starts playing, no issues with it. And here is the Cinebench R20 score. So I did expect a little bit better than the score we've got here. So almost 1,100 points on the multi-core score. I was hoping for, well, a lot more, another 300 points than this. And I'm not too sure why. I've retested this quite a few times. And this is just the score that uh, I do get with this particular CPU. 4K video editing now. So yes, it is possible with this spec with the 8 gigabytes of RAM. And you can install more RAM, which I've actually done. I've actually put another stick in there. So it's got 16 now. It is running in dual channel. And this performance, the timeline, is not too bad, but I only have the playback resolution to a quarter. So what I'll do now is export it, and we'll see how long it takes now. Because it's using Intel Quick Sync, this should be a little bit quicker here. So one minute of footage here to export, and that's using the 4K preset. I'll just hit start on the timer right now. So there's about a two, three second delay from that. And because it's using Intel Quick Sync, I do expect this to be quite quick with the quad core here. So it's about to finish up now, 99%. Once this bar disappears, so there we go, that you could say safely around about one minute and about say seven seconds to export one minute of footage is an excellent result. That is very, very good. Counter-Strike here looking at our gaming performance. So I have set it to the lowest possible settings, 1080p, and you might actually be better off with this one to use even 720p. You can see frame rate is, it's okay, it's around 60 frames per second, but I have seen with smoke grenades and a lot of other players on screen, it dipped down to about 40 there, which is not great. So let's see how long I last, which is not normally uh, long at all. Oh, a big lag just then, so that isn't good to see. Okay, I can see someone just through there. Oh, 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 he almost got me and I think I almost got him. Have another go. Oh, fire grenade. So then I don't want to go through those flames there because that'll be the end of me. And I see if I can just get up here. Another big lag there. And we won the terrace anyway. So gaming performance, I mean, it's adequate. It's okay. You can play these older, lighter titles on this configuration, but it's not a gaming laptop. You can see, look with, with all these players now, it's dipping into the mid 30s. Surface temperatures now, so we are looking about 42, 43 degrees in the middle of the keyboard. Now the vent at the top, that's just above the keyboard where the screen is. You can see that big hot area. That's the hot air being pushed out of it. That's not actually where the keyboard is. That's just the gap and above it. That is reaching 48 degrees there. So the thermals are actually okay. And the internal temperatures, it has not gone over 82 degrees Celsius. No thermal throttling. And what about fan noise? Well, this is a sample of it. Under load, playing games, this is what you can expect from this. It's not that loud, but you can definitely hear the fan. Linux support, very good on this machine. Everything is working wireless. Bluetooth, the screen brightness controls, you can see there. And the audio too, that is working volume up and down, not a problem. The touchpad and performance does seem very good. So if you intend to run Linux on this machine, I don't think you're gonna have any issues. All right guys, so this laptop does have a few things going for it. I do like the fact that Chewy has finally put in this one a sodium RAM slot. So we have the eight gigabytes that's already soldered onto the motherboard. 
you can add an additional eight or even 16 gigabytes to then bring the total up to a maximum of 24 gigabytes of RAM. Now this chip is so far the fastest I have seen in a Chewy laptop. Normally we have the Gemini Lakes or they've had like the Sauron, the J4125, not really that powerful because they're only like 10 watts or six watt CPUs. At least with this one, it, it's 28 watts. Still, I did notice that the Core i5, the 8259U hasn't been performing as fast as I've seen it in say many PCs or other laptops and I believe it's due to power limits. Now, of course, I could go into the BIOS, which is fully unlocked by the way, as I pointed out. I could increase the power limit and I could undervolt it and really squeeze a lot more performance out of this model here, but I'm reviewing it here as you would take it right out of the box so you know exactly what to expect. Now the big real con of this particular model here is the battery life. So the 28 watt CPU, if you're doing light tasks, you can get around four hours out of this. So it's not a brilliant runtime. It's a relatively, well, small size battery, 46 watt hours for a 28 watt chip. Mm, yeah, not really that good. So I do hope that Chewy can start to use larger batteries in them and maybe something like just a 60 or 70 watt hour battery would be a lot better and then we'd be able to achieve maybe six to seven hours of battery life mixed. Now, if you use this with something very demanding like you're editing a video or you're playing a game, then you're only gonna get around about an hour and a half to two hours battery life out of this with the screen. The screen is another positive here, 1440p, the three by two aspect ratio and the brightness isn't too bad. So around 360 nits that I'm measuring and the color coverage of Adobe coverage that is of 74% isn't that bad considering the price of this one. So it will be selling for around 479 US dollars and that price converted to euros and the spec you're getting at least for the market here, local market in Europe, isn't bad at all for what you're getting with the backlit keyboard. It's a very nice keyboard to type on and what's on offer. But I know in other markets like the US do look around, maybe you can pick up say a Dell or an HP or an Acer uh, with a more modern processor and a larger battery capacity that could actually be a better deal for you there. So thank you so much for watching this review here of the Chewy CoreBook X. I hope I did cover all the bases there so at least you know exactly what to expect if you're considering buying one of these. And I'll see you hopefully in the next one. Do subscribe for more.